Okay, well, fantastic. Uh, today on That's Classic, it's a really unique one. It's a special one. Um, I have none other than the last surviving cast member and a, an Academy Award nominee, I'd like to also state that, um, from Sunset Boulevard, wh which, by the way, I'd also like to mention, was in the top 100, <clears throat> excuse me, top 100 films by the American Film Institute. In fact, it's ranked number 12th. So uh, it's quite amazing. So I'd like to welcome Nancy Olson Livingston. Nancy, thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, I really appreciate it. You know, I, I've got to tell you right out of the gates, um, I'm actually from Milwaukee originally. You're no, that is the truth. I am. Oh. I'm, I'm from How there. And you are from Wisconsin as well. I'm from Milwaukee. I grew up there. That is just great. My mother and my sister still live there. So it's pretty crazy. Oh goodness. I'm sure yeah. it's a great deal, but not that much. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, um, so I will, why don't we start off with Sunset Boulevard right away? And um, I, I wanted to know, um, can you tell the story? I had heard and I've read that Billy Wilder kind of followed you around the lot or to the commissary to, uh, and, you know, like to talk to you. And, and that's how this all came about. It, it, what's the real story? The real story is that I I was a student at UCLA, a theater arts student. I'd spent a year at the University of Wisconsin and transferred to UCLA. And oh my God, what a blessing to be in the climate of Los Angeles after Madison in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Oh my goodness. Wow. But I wrote to my parents and said, and said why does anyone live anywhere else? <laughs> <laughs> but I did many, many plays and musicals, comedies, dramas, Shakespeare, Moliere, Tennessee Williams. And um, by the way, I, I think that every young person who wants to be a performer, education is so valuable. It really, it, it charges your understanding of the world, how it works, how it doesn't work. And it you use that all the time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, the, the, uh, person who was head of the talent agency at Paramount came out and saw me in a play. And uh, he knocked on the door after it was over where I was taking off my makeup. And he said, gave me his card and said, I would like to have you come to the studio and I think we'll give you a screen test. And I was rather fascinated with it. And I went and met him and he arranged for the test. And I did it. And then he said, he called and he said, well, we're going to sign you wow. to a seven year contract. And um, we'll be, you know, I could not accept the payment because I was not yet 21. I was 20 going on 21. And so my, my, my income never changed <laughs> my allowance. Wow. And, <laughs> I was a Kappa Kappa Gamma from the University of Wisconsin. I lived in the house for summer school, but I couldn't live in the house during the winter because I was an out of state student. And so I lived with my aunt and uncle, he was a Dean at UCLA uh, in the Pacific Palisades. So I woke up with the ocean in the morning and then I drove down Sunset Boulevard and with the, looking at the mountains during- Oh my this gosh. Year. I mean, it was quite amazing. And anyway, I went, they called me and they said, we're signing you and uh, we will let you know of any assignments that you will be given. And then I started visiting the lot because it, I parked there and they let me through the gate. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I started to explore. But all of a sudden, I got another phone call. And they said, we are lending you to 20th Century Fox to do Canadian Pacific. Oh, yeah. a movie. Randolph Scott, who was as old as my father. I think he was a year older. Wow. <laughs> and uh, you would be playing a Canadian Indian. And I said, <laughs> sorry. And it's in color. I I have blue eyes. I'm Scandinavian. I have, I'm a dark blonde, but I don't think I look like an Indian. <laughs> <laughs> they said, 
Well, you're only half Indian, which is <laughs> your blue eyes and your coloring. And but they'll dye your hair very dark in the morning, and that's you're you're going to play the part. Wow. Now the value of the, that. But, but by the way, it was at the end of the summer, which was perfect because I could do it and then go back to school. Unbelievable. All. Anyway, I did it and I learned valuable lessons about how the camera works and how we rehearse for the camera and how, you know, action cut, what does all that mean? And close-ups and how to deliver to a camera rather than to a theater audience. Wow. It's completely it's completely different. Anyway, I finished that and it came out and then they called me again and they said, we are now going to put you in a Billy Wilder film called Sunset Boulevard. And they sent me the script. Now, what had happened was that in my visiting of Paramount, I was going to the talent agency and reading with other new actors to see if they wanted to sign them. That was part of my job. Oh my and God. So I, people got to know me just walking around. I mean, I love watching Bing Crosby and Bob Hope and, oh. and Betty Hutton and the, all the stars that I knew about, but I didn't know, obviously. That had to be and, incredible. Incredible. Yeah. And then I went to lunch in the commissary and I always tried to sit as close to the writer's table as I could because the conversation was hilarious and funny. And I loved the eruption of laughter and their self, you know, glorification. Wow. <laughs> and, um, Billy would stop me as I'm traveling around exploring. And he'd walk to the commissary, commissary with me. And he wanted to know what was it like to be a student at UCLA? What was I studying? What was I doing? He wanted to know what was it like being a doctor's daughter growing up in the Midwest? What was growing up in the Midwest like? And these were interesting questions, but odd. Mm -hmm. it, Strange, and I couldn't quite figure out why. Yeah. But then when I read the script, I was in a, Betty Schaefer is an aspiring writer. So he had to have somebody and very ambitious, very determined, very. Yeah. Well, listen, my nickname in college was Wholesome Olson. <laughs> Sorry. I'm a, great as you can get and <laughs> as honest and uh easy but also articulate educated mm -hmm. and believe that perhaps this young lady or this young girl was an aspiring writer so what he did was he cast me as me wow he wanted me to wear my own and Edith Head had some various costumes and he said, no, 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 no. I like what Nancy had on yesterday when she visited the set. Oh my gosh, to Edith Head, the legend. And, and but Edith Head was wonderful, by the way. But she, and she understood. Huh. So she took out things. I didn't have a great wardrobe. I mean, I, I grew up in Milwaukee, came to UCLA. I didn't even know where to shop, really. Right. And I didn't. I'm, I just didn't have time, but I put myself together as best I could. I went into Westwood to the various places, Bullocks. Yeah. Remember? And, um, and I bought what I needed and did the best I could. Anyway, I think that's why he cast me. And I think even the studio was concerned about why do you want her? Really? Yes. And he was determined. And um, it was interesting.
but I'm so grateful that he did no because kidding. because I it was I learned something extraordinary I'd learned the art of filmmaking just by his my observation of mm -hmm. how to put all the pieces together and I learned about what movie making, what the core of it, the truth of it was really about. Wow. Truth of it is that it was a business and stars were commodities, mm. were hyped to sell mm -hmm. the product. And they made you, they talked about you being more beautiful than you really were. Hmm. And sexy and more whatever. Mm -hmm. Ella Monroe was the perfect person. And she you was knew her. I knew I met her a number of times, but and but I got a sense of who she was. Yeah. And she was extremely vulnerable, which and she accepted anything they wanted her to do. Mm -hmm. She would do it only even a little more. Yeah. And uh she died tragically very because she was about she was in the process of being thrown away oh wow she was six years old oh. and so i this became an awareness for me and i remember sitting on the sound stage with a, getting there at seven in the morning for hair and makeup nine o'clock on the set 12 for lunch one back on the set, finish at six, drive to the Palisades, take off makeup, shower, have a little supper, look at tomorrow's work, and go to bed. Wow. What kind of life was there for a young girl, mm -hmm. a growing up girl? What? How did I, I my, my friends at UCLA disappeared. Yeah. I couldn't see them. We were working, by the way, six days a week then. Oh my gosh. So you only had Sunday off. Wow. So I thought, but by this time, by the way, the studio was so fascinated with the movie. They were watching the dailies at five, you know, at six o'clock with the cameraman and the director. They were making like 14, 15 movies all at once on right. a lot. And at six o'clock, they showed the dailies. And people would show up for their own dailies and to see yesterday's work and wow. didn't come off as they wanted it to. Well, people started seeing Sunset Boulevard and they didn't leave until they saw the next dailies. Wow. <laughs> they had to bring in more seats. <laughs> I mean, usually they saw their own and left. Right, but, right. No, no, they got there early and they were waiting for Sunset. Wow. So I was aware, too, of them immediately putting me in a film with starring Bing Crosby and me. Now, I again, I was much too young for Bing Crosby. That was ridiculous. What, what, what movie was that? Which movie was that? <laughs> Mr. Music. Wow. Wow. It's not the, the most wonderful movie in the world, but somebody called me from London literally a month ago and said, I just want to hear your voice. I found your number. I got it. And I'm your, one of your greatest fans. And my favorite movie is Mr. Music. <laughs> I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> Possible. Um, anyway. How was Bing, by the way, what was it like working with Bing? Bing was, uh, very distant. He had a cold blue eye, as I used to, as I've written. And yet we became friends. Interesting. He, uh, I, I was never flirtatious with him. I was straight and I wanted to do what they wanted me to do to make it all work. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. If you see the movie, you don't quite believe it. But the man in Oxford loves it. <laughs> <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> was he so offset was Bing like 
you know, like conversational or would, when you say distant, would he go to like his dressing room or go to his had an entourage of followers who listened to his stories, laughed at all of his nuances and 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 but he kept this distance between him and they. Wow. Wow. And with me, we became friends. Uh-huh. And it was just straight friends. Mm. And he I was treated by the whole set, the director, Bing, like a, a charming child. Oh. <laughs> That's how he treated me. <laughs> wow. Wow. Anyway, then I, I was immediately then put in another movie with Bill Holden called Union Station. Yeah, which, right, right, right. With uh, Barry Fitzgerald is in that yeah, too, right? That, that, by the way, was a little more sophisticated. Uh -huh. And a little, it wasn't Sunset Boulevard, but it was a more interesting film. And then they put me in the most awful film with Bill again called Submarine Command. Don't ever see it, don't bother. <laughs> and then I had met somebody a writer, a genius, yeah. Alan J. Lerner. He had mm -hmm. written Brigadoon, which I fell oh, in love with. I love it. It is absolutely, the score is just incredible. Mm -hmm. He was writing for a, an American in Paris at MGM. Wow. And we he started taking me out to dinner and we eventually became engaged. And I'd said to Paramount, I don't want to be a movie. No, no Sunset wasn't out yet. Oh, oh my gosh. I didn't know that you had you had left before Sunset even was yes. released. Yes. And I married Alan Lerner, moved to New York, and said to Paramount, I'm so sorry, but I am not interested in being a movie star. First of all, by the mid Midwestern, you're a mid you right. grew up in Midwest too. Uh, doctor's daughter br having a brother cousins aunts uncles family family how many movie stars were successfully married with being a wife mother grandmother running a home yeah uh, no uh not many no but how could I even envision the rest of my life without that? That was a part of me. That was my DNA. So for me, movie, I Sunset taught me. You're, you know, they're they're making you into a movie star. Watch out. Wow, that is that is amazing. You know, Nancy, I swear, out of anyone I've ever talked to, you are the most like, especially for your age at the time. You were so mature and so like forward thinking. I mean, you were in the the cusp of what every starlet would have loved to have been in. You were there and you were able to step back, look at it and say, no, I actually, I, I also want a real life. I mean, I know I had even read where you said, look, doing two hours a day with the makeup and then doing all of this, it was just, it was just too much. I had no friends. And, um, so I find that I find that really amazing that you were able to and I and my only guess is the time you spent in Wisconsin growing up instilled those those good values and you were like able to look at it and go no this isn't what I want. Exactly. Now, I married the wrong man. I married I don't regret having married Alan because sure. I was what I was exposed to first of all we have two beautiful wonderful daughters and i i have three fabulous granddaughters and i have now a great grandson hey <laughs> so i i mean i can't complain no plus my fair lady was dedicated to me i also, saw that nancy with love yeah what what tell my tell me the story because i heard that the song one of the songs at least was written because of you well, first of all, I, I had the good fortune of being married to Alan during this apex of his career. He wrote Paint Your Wagon. Wow. And wrote the movie Royal Wedding. Yeah. Then he, uh, he went back with Fritz and he wrote um, My Fair Lady. 
then they they said, you know what, we're not going to do another theater musical because Fair Lady has put a period on this period of, of this historic moment in the theater. We're going to do a movie, an original score, original movie, and they wrote Gigi. Wow. Which is one of my favorite scores. Oh, of course. And, I mean, everyone is a classic, please. And then when, uh, just before we were divorced, Alan was reading The Once and Future King about King Arthur and the Round Table mm -hmm. and thinking about Camelot. Oh, I love Camelot. And oh, it's about to open again. It's oh, been really? written by Andrew Sorkin, the, the the book, which is it was that was needed. But the score is intact, and my daughters are going to all the rehearsals and to the uh, preview sh uh, showings of it in New York. It's going to open, I think, in a couple of weeks. And they said it is fabulous. Wow, I so, love it. Anyway, I don't regret having been there. Now, to give you an example, we we were in the country when we were first married, and uh, we were he was running a very formal household. Now, I we had a live-in housekeeper when I was growing up, so that I was used to having help in the house. Yeah. But we had we had a couple, and every meal was french service oh my I, gosh so i had to plan all these meals as i said I, be, I i got a phd in housekeeping let me tell you yeah but um and i planned the parties and the dinner parties and the luncheons and oh my goodness but we were in new york and there was a downstairs studio that alan and fritz worked in mm -hmm. and i buzzed one afternoon alan was alone working and he said come downstairs i need I, I have a problem and so i walked down the stairs and he said nancy uh the the playwright the famous english playwright who did pygmalion um he his in the play pygmalion mm -hmm. higgins does not acknowledge that he's in love with Eliza Doolittle. Wow. I know that he is, but this, it'll come to me in a minute, the playwright. I mean, he's a hard, yeah, I'm famous. really sorry. I, don't, I, can't, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Yeah. But you know who I mean. Anyway, uh, he said, I said, he said, I, I have to write a love song that isn't a love song. I said, would you like a cup of tea? And he said, great. Idea. So I went racing up the stairs and the help was resting. It was four in the afternoon. And I fixed the tea tray. And I came down these narrow stairs with a railing on one side, open on the other. God help me if I, you know. Yeah, fall. going right off it, yeah. So I'm coming down very carefully with the tray and he's looking at me and he said you know something nancy he said you really are a very pretty girl i said alan how long have we been married i said you work at home we have breakfast lunch and dinner together i said you see me all every day all day long you've just noticed <laughs> and he said oh come on he said, it's just that I've become accustomed to your face. Oh my gosh. And with that, he said, don't move, don't move. And he went racing over to his desk, paper, tablet, pencil. And he wrote in his little tiny handwriting, I've grown accustomed to her face. Oh my gosh. And he forgot about me. And I picked up the tray, went upstairs, the doorbell, the the doorman called from downstairs saying, uh, Mrs. Lerner, uh, Mr. Lowe is here. He says he's expected. And I said, yes, of course, have him come up. And so he was in the vestibule, in the elevator in the vestibule. And then I opened the door when he rang the bell. And he said, Nancy, he said, I understand. I've been summoned. I said, I know. 
because Alan, you see, has the lyric now halfway. Now wow. he needs to sit down and start creating the music with him. And he said, by the way, I've been I've been invited to stay for dinner. I said, we've already set a place for you. <laughs> <laughs> and two nights later, Fritz, oh, Fritz would left at about oh midnight. And I walked him to the front door. And he said, um, he said, conception has taken place. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he came back. Or he didn't come back because now the melody has been done. Now it's up to Alan to finish the lyric. Mm -hmm. Two nights later, he came. He said, I've been summoned again. I said, I've been expecting you. There's a place for you for dinner. And he went down, they had dinner, they talked, they went back down into the studio. I got undressed, ready for bed, and about one o'clock in the morning, they're buzzing me. Oh my gosh. I'm down immediately. And I was just about to go to sleep, but so I get out my slippers, my robe, and I go down the stairs, and they put me in the chair, and Fritz goes to the piano, Alan is standing in the curb of the piano, and they sang, he sang to me, I've grown accustomed to her face. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I mean, like a classic at this point. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I think, I think Alan did want to acknowledge me when he dedicated the book and said to Nancy with love. Oh, I think so. I think so. That is an amazing story. Oh, my gosh. Um, well, let's go back to Sunset Boulevard, because I'm sure <laughs> a bunch of people, I, I love, there's so many things to talk with you about, Nancy. You're such a pleasure. Um, the uh, with, with Sunset Boulevard, there's so many different aspects. One, Gloria Swanson, who was a silent screen star herself. I mean, star, she was one of the biggest, is... Um, did you get a sense of that? Well, had you honestly, had you ever even heard of her uh, no. prior to then? No, I had to ask my mother who she was and she explained to me who she was. And she had been a commodity and was thrown away. Mm -hmm. And she, of all the people on the set, understood that this film was about something that was told the truth. Mm -hmm. and that it would never be forgotten. And as you say, out of 100 movies, it's number 12. Literally, yeah. I mean, th that is extraordinary when you think of it, isn't it? Oh, it's so extraordinary. Are you kidding me? That's they, you, you will never be forgotten. I mean, come on. I mean, all of this is well, it's incredible. The thing that's amazing, though, is that the, the cars, the wardrobes, the time it's it's it, it's dated on the other hand it's so contemporary it is because it is the truth about how, how life in the world works yep it still works the same way you know by the way you mentioned the cars there's that car that max drives you know the eric von stroheim yeah. character um what what because there's that one scene where you're with william holden you're in your office he's with you he's stopped by because she's come to the studio and the car is literally down below. And I thought it was amazing filmmaking. You're you're talking and the camera's over here. And through the window, you can still see the car and you can still see the two guys checking it out that were there, to, you know, they wanted to uh, rent it for that, the studio. That's the brilliance of the camera and storytelling. It was incredible. What what so was the car? What do you remember that car? Was it very well? I mean, it was bizarre. Yeah. It was, a, it was, a, it stood out so well. The, um, yeah. so let's talk a little, so Gloria Swanson, then did she tell you or talk to you at all about her time? No, but what she did was she, of all the people said, this film is, will make a tremendous statement and we will never be forgotten. Any of us. God, talk about insight. Now, then we've got Eric von Stroheim, who is also one of the biggest directors from that time. I, I got to tell you, there's a line in there where he says, um, the three biggest directors were D.W. Griffith, Cecil B. DeMille, and, and and inside I'm going, and Eric von Stroheim, but he says his, you know, his character. And um, 
it's just it's just an amazing moment in filmmaking where you're looking at somebody who really was that. Um, yes. What and was he like? Oh, go he ahead. Was very formal. He'd arrive in the morning on the set with his white gloves, his butler's gloves, and he. We all had chairs with our name on them, and he would get into his chair, but he would. Excuse me. He sure. would sit up to the camera as close as he could, because he was so fascinated with Billy's direction and how and his use of the camera. Wow. Because filmmaking is, you know, as I've written. Alan Lerner said, you, Nancy, you don't go to a bookstore and buy a screenplay, but you go to a bookstore and you buy Shakespeare, you buy mm -hmm. Williams. Yeah, that's true. So he said, the, you, you, if you have a moment, if you, have, you have the proscenium arch in the theater and you have a moment of great sadness, you don't just sit in a chair and put your head down mm -hmm. you have to express it in language so it hits the back row of the top balcony right and but in movies you have the camera that could come right in mm -hmm. and that one tear coming down your cheek that's all we need to know yeah it's the best i love that so, so oh go ahead go ahead please well, it's it's that movie making is an art form that is completely of its own. I mean, it's a it's a particular and some people know how to do it brilliantly, like Billy. Right. And some do not. Oh, I definitely. Mean, was was he a difficult director, by the way? Was he what? Was he difficult to work with or was what was he no, like to work no, with? No, no. It was so difficult, and, and Shirley McLean and I talked about this years ago. Uh, he absolutely refused to do more than one shot. One shot? You'd have to literally fall down where he'd have to say, okay, we have to start over again. Wow. I did my first scene all the way through, and I kind of had a moment of hesitation in the middle of it, and I Anyway, I kept going and I finished it, cut. And he said, cut and print. I said, oh, Billy, please, I gotta do it one more time. And he said, nope, print. Wow, wow. <laughs> well, that puts you on guard for the next scene. Mm -hmm. What I mean. Oh, I bet, I bet. Was your first, uh, the first scene that you shot, was it in sequence with the film? Is it, the, is it when you walk into, the uh, uh, the the producer's office, you know, and and William Holden's in there. Is that the first shot? That's the first scene we shot with me. Oh, wow, wow. And had you met uh, William Holden, by the way, before? Oh yes, we were. Oh yes, we were introduced, and I came and visited the set anytime I wanted, and I watched him, and I would comment with him, and we'd talk and gossip a little bit. Um, I, I, Bill and I became very dear toward each other. I mean, we valued each other's friendship and presence. And, you know, as I've, I, I, I've written about the moment years after we finished films mm -hmm. and both hired and uh, he's coming in from Europe and Alan and I, Alan, that's my second husband, Alan Livingston and I, mm -hmm. we're going and, and we were going to go on catching our next plane we came in from LA and now we had to change planes to go to Europe. And I'm, we're walking down the hall to the, to get up to the next place to get on the plane at the next gate. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I hear from way back and down the hall, a voice that says, Nancy. And I turn around and I said, Bam. and I got to tell you, the two of us ran toward each other. We hadn't seen each other in about three years. And wow. we embraced and hugged and kissed. And he said, how are you? He said, you're married again. Are you happy? Is it all okay? I mean, he, it was just wonderful to see him. Wow. And I said, 
not you. I said, oh, you're now you're divorced again. I mean, what are you doing? You know? Yeah. And, and um, a man walked by. This is true. And he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, excuse me. I just have to say, this is better than watching an old movie. <laughs> <laughs> so he saw a scene with me and Bill Holden that was totally brand new. <laughs> wow. Did, did by the way, you know, William Holden, uh, definitely one of my favorite actors, by the way. But I was curious, did he have... Uh, because he, I, be, I believe, what was it? Was it that he was drinking and he had unfortunately had hit his head and that how that happened? Is did he have an an issue with with alcohol? I don't even know. Oh yeah, absolutely. He was, you know, he was a very desperate person when he was making Sunset, and so was Joe Gillis. Wow, Joe Gillis was losing his car, his apartment, his job, his dreams, mm -hmm. and he sold his soul yeah. for survival and betty schaefer is so, she's an opportunist we all are mm -hmm. the, i betty schaefer recognizes that he has a gift that can help her get her dreams made right but she's honest about it she tells him oh yeah, yeah. she is very straight again Mm -hmm. But she falls in love with a man who has sold his soul for survival. Right. Right. And he, so, so you, you, felt, you felt Bill was like that too? Like Bill was, he, well, he was. Bill, Bill was in a very bad marriage at that point. I mean, it was falling apart. He had two sons in that marriage that he was very concerned about. He was drinking at night much too much. Mm was faltering in the morning but it was perfect for joe gillis right it fit the it fit the part to a t yeah and also he realized that working with billy wilder was going to change or could change his life and career because he and billy became close and billy wilder understood the incandescent gift of bill on screen i mean movie stars have that and it's very mysterious i don't know where it comes from but it's uh, interesting it's amazing to me it's so amazing so on a whole nother level i mean i, I gotta tell you i just i seriously i find your life fascinating um you but were listen, you cannot let me finish without saying that i married the most terrific man in the entire world and changed my life i was living in new york i was single after i was divorced from alan lerner for over five years oh wow those, i didn't realize those are difficult years and bringing up my two little girls i had a very uh lavish life i uh, you know i was well taken care of mm -hmm. and i made three i did three plays on broadway Wow. So I was busy and I did one film too, but uh, I was lonely and I was desperate and I met Alan Livingston. I never made a, made a mistake. Alan, darling, I was always right. <laughs> Got with, it. With both husbands. Um, <laughs> NOL forever. It's great. Uh, but Alan Livingston was also brilliant and extremely gifted and successful. A Capitol and Records executive, right? He started off, at, got, was in the army. Went, he went to Penn, uh, Pennsylvania University, graduated with the highest honors. So did Alan Lerner, graduated from Harvard, two very educated guys. Mm -hmm. And then he started at Capitol and they said, we want you to do, we need some uh, children's albums. He created Bozo the Clown. And after that, which never, it, children's albums sold maybe 50,000, uh, sold millions. He actually created Bozo the Clown. Oh, absolutely. Totally. Wow. wow. I mean, Bozo's still around today. I mean, it, you still see Bozo the Clown. 
I know. And, and if you, well, anyway, I've written all about that. And then he made Nat Cole a soloist. He was, a, you know, the trio. He was the piano player. Yeah, right. And he heard Nat sing a few phrases and he said, Nat, you're a soloist. And Nat Sat said, no. And they put out Nature Boy and boom, you know. Wow. What about Frank Sinatra? I saw, I did see that he, he was involved with that, that whole. And also Frank, Frank, who was, you know, the, took the, everybody a breath away during the forties in 1953, when Alan was at, at uh, Capitol, he was let go by Columbia and said, and Columbia Records said, you're through and made a public statement. Frank Sinatra's career is over. Oh my and God. All from w William Morris, an agent, and said, Alan, would you be interested in signing Frank Sinatra? Oh my gosh. And Alan said, I would. And he said, You would? He said, He is the most gifted interpreter of the American song ever. I agree. And he needs new repertoire and a new arranger conductor. And he put him together with Nelson Riddle and they put out Young at Heart, oh, which wow. completely started Frank's career all over again. Did Frank did Frank become a friend of, of yours or in your husband's or, or not? Long story and it's in the book because Frank, when Alan left Capitol and went to NBC television, he created Bonanza. Oh. That is an amazing story, amazing story about people's jealousies and how they wanted Alan not to succeed. Wow. And they wanted to kill Bonanza from being it, it, uh, supported by any advertiser. They, they went, the head of NBC in New York was so jealous of Alan. And Alan is like this, focused on what he wants to create. Oh, he created Bonanza. Wow. Named it. Got his brother to do da 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 da, -da, -da you know. Anyway, helped him write the first script. So he went to General Sarnoff and said, I have to leave because uh, Kins, whatever his name was, will not allow me to succeed. And, but he said that I have, we have got a two, three episodes of Bonanza that I promise you could be a huge hit. Wow. And General Sarnoff liked Alan. He said, look, I can't fire my, my son's choice. Mm -hmm. But he said, I'll do you a favor, Alan. I promise that we'll put out nine episodes of Bonanza and we will own them. We won't try and sell them. Wow. It was the most valuable property that NBC ever had. Wow. That's so amazing. Really. And back to Capitol Records mm -hmm. and signed Beach Boys, oh. marries me. He signs the Beatles. I'm entertaining the Beatles. Oh, come on. Come oh, on. Yeah. You're, okay, you have to tell the story. Come on. How, how did you entertain the Beatles? No. You have to read the book. You I would, mean, I, I will, but just tell me, what was it like having them in your house? There, there, it is such, both, the two made major parties, oh my God, they were amazing. So you, you have to read it. I mean, you and your- oh, I promise you, I'll read, by the way, just for my audience, it's called A Front Row Seat. And- yeah. um, and Nancy Olson Livingston, which is Alan Livingston is my second husband. I am Nancy Livingston to the world in LA, but right. I am the Olson Livingston. And the book is a front row seat. And it tells all these stories and much, much more. I mean, Jack Kennedy, my, my relationship with him is fascinating. Okay, can you at least tell us how you met Jack Kennedy? I mean, that's just a little, that's like yeah, nothing. Read it because it tells a story. It's probably one of the more interesting chapters in book one. Book, I, the book is book one and book two put together. 
Hmm. Book one starts with a letter to my daughters the day that Alan Lerner dies. And I tell them, I will now tell you the story of your parents, their growing up, their childhood, their careers, their life together, and how you came into this world. And then I put it away for four years, the letter. Wow. Then I picked it up and I started writing the story that I promised my daughters. And then I put it down for a year or two. And then I picked it up and then I put it down. It took me years. But I end the first book one with the day I marry Alan Livingston. Hmm. Two starts with a letter to my son, Christopher Livingston, saying, I will now tell you the story of your father, his amazing career and life, our life together, and how this all has ended to today. Wow. And so that is the way the book is constructed. And the stories I'm telling you are all there. That's amazing. And between, and you know, because you're from Milwaukee, mm -hmm. that I don't know how else but to tell the truth. Yeah, you're right about that. You're right about that. I uh, I, I I can see that. Did, well, come on, okay, tell me this then. If you if I realize, believe me, I'll be reading the book. I'm sure many of my listeners will too. But the with John F. Kennedy, obviously you met John F. Kennedy, you met Marilyn Monroe. Do you believe in like from your angle, do you believe that that ever did take place, that they did, you know, get together? Because you always hear about that. Of course. Yeah. They got together. But he made an advance to me that was quite extraordinary the night that I met him. But he, I he, wait, wait, he made an advance on you as well? I have to read it. I'm sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> we ended up, he got nowhere. I, mm -hmm. you know, and I described to you the evening, the small dinner party with Joan Crawford, oh, geez. Charlie Feldman, who ran the, the a huge agency. Yeah. And, me, and Jack Kennedy. Oh my gosh. And the whole evening is extraordinary. And I got to know Jack and Jackie. Huh. over years and we we were we became friends yeah and i was at joe alsop's house the night he was inaugurated i went to his inauguration and i was there after the balls jackie went back to the to the white house because she just had had little, the little boy john mm -hmm. and um jack showed up at jack joe alsop's house and i answered the door and there were 12 of us. Oh, my gosh. And it written about that evening and him sitting in front of the fire with a cigar in one hand, glass of brandy in the other, reminiscing about the day. And it was extremely interesting. Wow. 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 I mean, what a moment in history right there. Wow, right. Nancy. That's amazing. I yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's that's uh that's amazing in itself. Hey, by the way, going back to Wisconsin, um, I my sister actually is the one, my sister Leanne, she um she's the one that actually uh she saw your article in the Milwaukee Journal, and that's how you and I have connected. I that's I was like, I need to talk to Nancy. But um in there it said that you uh you're on the wall of inspiration at Wauwatosa High School. Like you're yeah. on there. Did you go back for that? I'm just curious. I was invited, but I, you know, I'm I'm 94 years old. Yeah, you look unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I I'm not traveling anymore. Yeah. I drive I, during the day. I drive to the hairdresser, to the bank, to the pharmacy, to lunch. Mm -hmm. Or but uh I I don't, I, I just cannot travel anymore. I cannot go to into a strange hotel room and wake up in the middle of the night and try on my own to get to the to the bathroom and not know where I am. I, I, I can't do it. Yeah, I, I totally understand. Um, let's, let, there were, there was a whole nother, like, okay, so you had the Sunset Boulevard period and then you, you come back in the 50s 
And by the way, you were in some of my favorite. I mean, I love some Sunset Boulevard. It's in the top for me. But I also love, I'm a big Disney guy. And I loved Absent Minded Professor, Son of Flubber. I mean, you were terrific in those movies. What was that like working with, with on the Disney lot versus like the Paramount lot? Well, I, I didn't write this, but I, I, I'm sorry that I didn't because in 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 all the interviews I've been talking about Disney um, and at answering questions, I talked about visiting the lot for the first time and how different it was. And the best way to describe it, Paramount, MGM, Warner Brothers are like big cities. Mm -hmm. You walk on the Disney lot it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everybody's name, including Walt. Everybody calls each other by their first name. Hi, Walt. Hi, <laughs> Hi Nancy. Hi, Bill. Wow. It's like a small town. Wow. And I loved working there. It was, and Fred McMurray, again, as old as my father. Yep, yep. Grew up in Milwaukee. No, I know that. I know that. Another famous one, you're right. We talked about growing up in the Midwest a lot. He was a Republican, I'm a Democrat. Mm -hmm. So he told Walt Disney about politics, and he talked about growing up with me. And also, what's so interesting is that he was married to June Haver, and they had two little girls and he would make dinner every night. And at the end of the shooting at around five o'clock, he'd say, Nancy, we had lamb chops last night. What do you think I should make tonight? <laughs> I do that. That's so funny. <laughs> oh, uh, you know, which was bizarre when you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, work. The Absent Minded Professor is an amazing film. I started by doing Pollyanna. Oh, with Haley Mills. Uh, with, yeah. And and Jane Wyman and Carl Malden and Agnes Moorhead. Oh, and gosh, that's they, what right. They, did, they called me and they said, I was in Mallorca. And I get a call, Walt Disney is calling you. What? I thought, that's odd. Anyway, it was Disney people and Walt saying, you've got to do this. We've got, we're going to spend more money for the first time on a film that is not animated. And we're going to get, and every role is going to be played by a well-known actor. Wow. They gave me the cast, went down the list. We want you. And it was Walt Disney, like Walt Disney, like not just, it was Walt. <laughs> You know, some executive producers or whatever. Oh, wow. Wow. And I said, okay, because it was at the end of the summer. I was coming to California anyway to visit my parents with my two little girls. And uh, I said, okay, I'll do it. And that's what's me at Disney. Oh, my gosh. Is that amazing? You were so good in that. Seriously, just so good. Just so natural. It was you just add to that Disney vibe. It was it was just great. Uh, did um, by the way, uh, Kevin Kakorin was in that movie too, I believe, with uh, in Pollyanna. Yeah, he was a great child actor. Oh uh, yes. Do you re do you re I'm just curious. What what was he like? Was do you remember? Was well, he like an rambunctious? Work with him, so I, you know, I don't really know. But he was very. Everybody had a, a friendly easy atmosphere it, it was disney partly created that wow. that was the kind of the tone what about Haley? what about Haley mills she's darling and so gifted and she's written a book oh i don't and, know if I, right. yes, I didn't realize that published it came out about six months ago and uh she is she's a lovely person lovely Oh wow! The by the way, the one that we uh, we didn't mention earlier was which I have never seen, but I I've I've always loved this actor was Smith with Glenn Ford. Did you know, I I don't. He was a very sad man. Oh wow! And I have not written that much about it because I don't. I was kind of in and out. 
I was not paying that much attention, really. I was dealing with what all, you know, my life has always been pressure. Mm -hmm. Always. You've got to do this. You've got to go there. We had, Alan and I, I, when Livingston and I, I said, why don't we get a little beach house in Malibu? And -hmm. then we could kind of, you know, just do summers and winters. He said, no, 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 Nancy. He said, we're going to get an apartment in New York. So now, which was great because my two daughters were in New York. Mm -hmm. One was going to a graduate school and the other one was started a job. And uh, so that I said, great. And I knew New York. I had filled with friends, which I've read about, all about Mm -hmm. them. Right. Interesting people. And uh, so we had an apartment in New York a house here, a son, ch- uh, stepchildren for him, my stepchildren, and for him, my two daughters. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were busy. <laughs> so you couldn't spend much time with Glenn Ford. <laughs> Please, no. When you said sad, though, is it sad? Once again, I had heard he had a drinking problem as well. Is that why you say sad? I, really, I, I can't comment on that because I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But he just was sad. I, I never... Uh, so I never played a scene with him, so I I don't know. I got you. The other the other thing I noticed is you did a um uh uh what was I going to say a cameo appearance in the nineteen ninety seven flubber. How did that come about? Oh, that because they called and said we're going to do another remake of this you know, of the absent minded professor flubber. Yeah, and. You know, I thought, well, okay, I, for one day, I could come in and do it. It was okay. You know, not great. No, it wasn't as good as the original. It wasn't even close. The original, the absent mind professor is, is a, it's a minor classic. It really oh. is. Oh, it totally is. Are you kidding me? It, 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 even from a special effects standpoint and all of that too, it's just, it's just so unique. Um, did, by the way, the one thing I was curious about, going back once more to Sunset Boulevard, were you at all intimidated going on that set and being around like, you know, you know, these people, even though you didn't know them, but knowing that, oh, she was part of the silent area, he was part of the silent area, this is Billy Wilder, you know, that, did it feel like that or well, not? Was it just like, I, oh, I'm just with fellow actors? I had already done Canadian Pacific with, you know, what Randolph is Randolph Scott. Randolph Scott and um, I I had visited the studio a lot and had a kind of a conversational relationships with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And I did not feel that intimidated, but I did feel that I had to live up to something because yeah. I was surrounded by the most gifted people literally yeah most, and the most uh, uh they understood this what they were doing you know they've been doing it a long time right and and so i was you know so i did have that nervousness but once we got going and once the scenes that bill and i had that progressed i felt more and more comfortable i got you it just took time to kind of feel like you were part of the right. same right and yeah. I felt very welcomed. It, it was a lovely experience. Were you there, by the way, the day that they shot the scene with Gloria Swanson? Uh, she's on. She's at the table. She's playing cards, and it's it's Buster Keaton, I believe, no. John Carradine. Okay. I didn't. Did uh, would you? By the way, what? I o'clock in the morning. I didn't have to be there. <laughs> oh my God, that was quite a scene. Well, even the fact that that's Cecil B. DeMille, which, by the way. That's a funny tie-in. I heard that he wanted you to be in um, uh, Samson and Delilah. Oh, that was and, ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, played the part. I mean, the fact that he even considered me was ridiculous. Ridiculous. <laughs> and I knew when I read it, I thought, oh, come on. <laughs> Nancy Olson from Milwaukee, Wisconsin is not the person to play this part. <laughs> Now but look, we've been talking an hour. Oh my God, we have. I'm sorry. We got. To, we've talked so much. 
Yeah, <laughs> I hear you. All right. Well, I'll let you go, Nancy. I I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. You were so great. I I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. But I want you to now read the book. Oh, because Nancy, it's a shoe in. I'll definitely be reading the book. Would you do me a favor? Sure. When you finish the book, will you just send me a message of what you thought of it? Oh, Nancy, I'll do that in a heartbeat. Are you kidding me? Of course I will. Okay. Yeah, I've got Chris. Well, Chris, had, I have his email, so I can I can send it through Chris. Send it to Chris and just get a few sentences. Just say, I particularly like this. I understood what you were saying about that and whatever. Well, I would love, I would love to. Are you kidding me? Without a doubt. And by the way, why don't we tell uh, the audience because they're going to be listening. They're going to go, "Where's the book? What you know?" Um, well, on on Amazon, I think that they, they have. They used to. I don't know if they still have. Uh, they did a month ago. They had ten books they recommended, and mine was one of them. So uh, they they can order it on Amazon and get one immediately. Okay. And what about, by the way, just out of curiosity, if, if anyone out there wanted to get an autograph picture or anything like that from you, is there anywhere where they can go for that? Yes, but I don't want to put it on TV now. But I understand. They, they can, they can, there is a, a link where they can find out where to send it. Okay. That's totally fine. Just good to know. Yeah. Well, listen, Nancy, I will uh, definitely get a hold of Chris and I thank you so much for being on. It's so fun. You know, like I said, I'm from Wisconsin. I went, by the way, I went to University of Wisconsin, Madison myself. Well, there you go. Yeah. <clears throat> and what about those winters? <laughs> well, that I don't miss. I am in LA now. I don't miss that. <laughs> I know neither. Yeah. I'm with <laughs> you. Well, listen, um, take care of yourself. Thank you so much. And if there's anything I can ever do for you, please let me know. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this too. I really oh, did. Thanks a lot, Nancy. Bye-bye. Hey, don't forget to hit the subscribe button in the corner of the video. And if you like the video, please hit the like button as well. And while you're here, take a look at some of the other great interviews from anybody from Jerry Mathers to Butch Patrick to Judy Norton. All fantastic. Have a great one.